started by saying was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen? Then in chapter 5, Jesus began to teach his sermon. Jesus began to teach. Everyone say teach. Say it again. Say it one more time. So Jesus Christ wanted to now bring about his manifesto. You know, now Jesus is a king. Don't forget we talked about Matthew presenting Jesus as the king. And one thing Jesus wanted to make sure we understand was that his kingdom was not an earthly kingdom, but a spiritual kingdom. There is an earthly ramification to it, but his coming, it was a spiritual kingdom. It was a setup of a spiritual kingdom. Everyone say kingdom. So in Matthew chapter 5, the Bible says that Jesus Christ went to the mountain and his disciples were around him. And the Bible says Jesus opened his mouth and he began to teach. And in this teaching, he was teaching them the this great sermon that has ever been preached by any man that has lived on the surface of the earth. So that means that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have to understand that the Sermon on the Mount is very, very important. Because if you are following Jesus, then you need to really follow what he says. Any other message that is being preached by any other person, if it does not line up with the message that Christ himself preached, they are just preaching their own message. Amen? Because Jesus Christ is who we follow. We're following Christ. So if we are following Christ, then we have to follow what he has taught us in the beatitude. Jesus Christ has taught many things in the scripture. But these eight beatitudes that Christ has taught is very paramount that we live by it. And, and, and as we're going to discuss this verse 6 today, we're going to dive a little bit deeper like we've always done beyond just that verse 6. We read chapter 5 verse 3 and chapter 5 verse 3 says blessed and we said that word blessed actually means happy. Everyone say happy. You see Jesus Christ knew what the audience is looking for. Jesus Christ knew the heart of the audience. That's why many books would sell today if the book begins by telling you what how to be happy. Everybody wants to be happy. Nobody wants to be sad. Everyone wants to be happy. So that's why you have some churches today where all the pastor teaches you have to be happy. People are going to go there because everybody wants to be happy. People want, there are so many amusement parks all around us because people want to have an excitement. They go to club to have an excitement. They go on the ride to have excitement. They want to be happy. Some, some resort to the bottles to have excitement. Some drink and some smoke weed to have excitement. So Jesus already knew how to draw his audience. He started by saying, happy. But little did, little did they know that his prescription for happiness is completely opposite to the prescription of the word for happiness. Everyone say, happiness is my portion. Now, the Bible says in chapter 5 verse 3, he said, happy or blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Poor in the spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we said weeks ago that to be poor in the spirit is referring to spiritual bankruptcy. It's referring to the state of, of your spirit where you know that you need a savior. And the next verse Jesus Christ taught about blessed are those who are what? Blessed are those who, who mourn. For they shall be what? So you are poor in the spirit. You are spiritually bankrupt. Now in verse 4, you are mourning over your sin. You are crying over your sin. You are mourning over your sin. So the first one is blessed are those who are poor in the spirit for, 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 and then blessed are those who mourn. Amen? And then last week we talked about 
Blessed are those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So the first one is blessed are those who, who are what? Poor in the spirit. Number two, blessed are those who mourn after their state of poverty. Number three, blessed are those who are meek, who are humble, because when they look at God in comparison to themselves, they see that they need him. They, so they humble themselves before the king of kings. And tonight we're going to be talking about blessed, happy are those who are hungry and thirsty after righteousness for they shall be what? Filled. See, the last few verses that we read represent pain. We talk about being poor is like a negative connotation. We talk about mourning is like it's negative. Now we talk about humbling yourself and bringing yourself down. It's like it's also negative. Now Jesus is taking a different level and he's saying, blessed are those who are hungry because now you're going to be what? Fool. So you are thinking now of a shift of this teaching of Jesus Christ. I'm going to deal very deeply on that tonight as we study more into this uh, fourth beatitude. But this beatitude so far, there is a link. Everyone say a link. Because when you are poor in the spirit, then you mourn over your sin and then you humble yourself because you see that God is just too much for you and then there is a hunger in you to be like God and to have the righteousness of God. Amen? So you pour in the spirit, you mourn over your state of poverty and you are meek or humble because God is really so mighty and then now you are hungry seeking after what God has because you are nowhere close to where God is. Did, did you get the link? Did you get the link? You all get the link? Or should I say it again? So, you are poor in the spirit. That means that you are spiritually bankrupt. Then, which means that your life of sin, you need a savior. Then you mourn over your sin for God to help you. It shows you that you are really in need of help. Then when you mourn over your sin, then you become humble, knowing that within you, there is nothing in you that is close to where God is. And now there is a hunger in you seeking the righteousness of God. Amen? So I want to make sure we get a sequence. So now let's talk about hunger. You know, people hunger over various things. Hunger is part of life. People are hungry. And when we talk about hunger, it's not just hunger for food. There are different kinds of hunger that people are hungry for. There are various examples in the scriptures that talks about hunger. Let us first start by giving an example of Lucifer. Lucifer was hungry. What was he hungry for? He was hungry for power. Everyone say power. Lucifer was hungry. He wants something in his life. And he said, you know what? I just want to be as powerful as God. You know, he was hungry for the wrong thing. He was hungry for the wrong reason. And you know what happened? God cast him out of heaven. Because he was hungry to have the power to absorb God. And he wants to take over the throne of God. He thought to himself, wow, I just want to be like God. Actually, I want to take over from God. He was hungry for power. And that is the wrong kind of hunger. Everyone say power. Then in the other kind of person we see in the Bible was a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was hungry after praise. He wants the praise of man. He wants to be worshipped. He wants men to praise him. And he boasts of himself. He talks about the great kingdom he has built. Before Nebuchadnezzar, there has not been any kingdom that was built on this earth like, like that of Nebuchadnezzar. He was a great king. But he wanted a praise. He wanted to receive praise. He was hungry after praise. 
And because of that, God also wasn't pleased with Nebuchadnezzar. And God said, because you are hungry for praise, you want men to praise you, you want hungry for fame, you want praise, that you know what, Nebuchadnezzar, for seven years, you, you won't even know what you're doing, I'm going to make sure you eat with the beast, with the white beast of the field. So for a period of time, for a season of time, Nebuchadnezzar was eating with the wild animals. This king became living in the forest, eating from eating grass and weeds. That became his food because he was hungry for the wrong reason. Everyone say hunger. So we talked about hungry for power, and we talked about hungry for for praise. The other kind of hunger. People also have hunger for pleasure. Hunger for pleasure. There's a, there's, a, there's a scripture in the Bible talks about this rich man. A hunger for pleasure and for possession. This rich man came to Jesus. See? But he wasn't quite ready. His hunger was really not for Jesus, but he has more hunger for his possession. Jesus Christ told him to follow me. He said, oh, no, no, I, I, I just can't do that yet. I have a lot of stuff to really take care of here. I got to, you know, I, I have too much possession. I, I just can't serve you because I have possession. So his hunger was more of material things. I may ask you tonight, what are you hungry for? Are you hungry for power? Are you hungry for the praise of men? Or are you hungry for possession? Or are you hungry for pleasure? Now these are the wrong kind of hunger. And many of us in this house today may fall into these four different categories. Some of you could be hungry for power. You want more power. You want to just prove that you got some power. And I've met people like that in church. They want to prove they got power. They really want to prove it they got power. They want to prove they feel so big that they got power. They are hungry for power. And that is not it. It is not about hunger for power. Or some are hungry for praise. They want to be praised. I just had a story today of one pastor who was hungry for praise. He wants people to praise him. So he does different things just to receive affirmation, just to receive the praise of men. But that is the wrong kind of hunger. Or hunger for pleasure. We, many of us fall in that category. We just want pleasure. We want pleasure. There is nothing wrong with pleasure, but when you are hungry for pleasure, then you are hungry for the wrong thing. The Bible blessed are those who hunger after what? Righteousness. Not after pleasure. Is pleasure good? Is pleasure good? I don't know if you like pleasure. <laughs> Exactly. But when your hunger, when your drive, when your ambition is for pleasure, that's wrong. Is praise? I don't know if you love to be praised sometimes. We all do. But if all your drive is for is to get the praise of men, then that's wrong. I don't know if you uh, love to have possessions, properties, and houses, and Maybe seven cars, drive one every day for seven days, then you switch to the next one. It's okay. But if that is your drive, if that is your, if that is your motivation, then that's wrong. So hunger is part of life. So when Jesus began to teach this Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And we'll say hunger and thirst after righteousness. We're going to talk a little bit about what hunger really means. But let us dive into one aspect of, or let, or let us dive into what Jesus Christ is really talking about here. The beatitude, the sermon on the mount, is not only a way into the kingdom, but is a lifestyle in the kingdom. I want to say it because that is very important. It is not the condition of getting in, it is a condition of life once you are in. 
That means that you are not only spiritually bankrupt before you get in, but you remain bankrupt even where you are in. It is not only mourning over sin before you get saved, it is a continuous mourning over evil even when you are saved. It is not only to be humble and to be meek so you can get saved, it's for you to remain humble and meek when you are saved. It's not only to be hungry and be thirsting after righteousness, but it's a continuous thirst and hunger after righteousness once you are in the kingdom. Amen? So the, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitude, it is not an entrance into the kingdom, it is both. It is entry into the kingdom and it's also the way of life in the kingdom. Is somebody getting this? So if you really want to know if you are saved, many of us, you know, we just claim we're saved. That's fine. I'm not going to argue with you if you are saved or not. That's between you and God as somebody would put it. But you have to ask yourself, um, have I been spiritually bankrupt? Am I really uh, 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 mourning over sin? Am I really in a place of humility before God? Am I hungry after the righteousness? If you are not, you got to ask yourself this question. Am I truly in God's kingdom? I know it's a tough message, but we all agreed we should study the scripture verse by verse, right? Amen? We, that's, that's our agreement. We should study this thing verse by verse so that God can speak to us. So I'm not just picking something I like that will not, will not hurt your flesh, but something that God wants us to really dive into. So it is not just a requirement to get into God's kingdom. It is the condition of life in God's kingdom. So you got to ask yourself, am I really living in God's kingdom? Am I even there yet? How do you know you are there? You know you are in there if some of these things, all of them, is actually part of your life. Because being in God's kingdom... It's not just saying, I'm born again. Repeat after me. I'm born again, I'm born again, I'm born again. That's it. No, that's not it. That is not it. It is actually going through this process. Are you bankrupt spiritually? I mean, spiritually, do you feel that you need God in your life? Are you really humble before God? Or do you just say, I don't care after all. Brother John is worse than me. I, mean, I am good, I'm okay. God want this to be not just an entry point but a lifestyle. Everyone say lifestyle. So the Bible says in verse 6, it says blessed are those who hunger after righteousness for they shall be what? Filled. For they shall be filled. We want to talk about what righteousness means but let us give you some example of some men in the scripture that we can emulate men in the scripture who are actually hungry. But by the way, what is hunger? I know many of us in America have, don't really know what hunger is. Many of us here have never really been hungry before. You think you have been, really you've not been, you don't know what hunger is. When Jesus was saying those who thirst and hunger after righteousness, He's talking to people who really know what it is to be looking for to, for, to fill their thirst. People who have really been hungry and thirsty. Some of us, we are thirsty after we run. <sighs> I need some water. <sighs> You're not thirsty. About going days and days and weeks without water. When you finally get water, what do you do? If you've gone for weeks without water, you want water so bad. You've gone for weeks without water, and suddenly you get water. How do you, how do you drink it? Do you say, mm. You just get this thing. If I without holding your breath, <sighs> blessed, happy are those who are hungry. The word hunger there, one, is a continued, is a continuous term. Hungry, thirsty, 
really hungry within you for the righteousness of God. There is a hunger in you. Something you know that you need that your life depends on it. Many of you say you are hungry because your meal, your lunch is supposed to be at 12.30 and now it's 2. You say, my God, it's past 2. It's past my lunch time. I think it's time for me to eat. You're not really hungry. If you've been hungry before and you see food, it's different. So I understand you may not really know what it means to be hungry. But I want to challenge you tonight that when Jesus is talking about being hungry, it's referring to a is 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 referring to a desperation. You are desperate. You know your life depends on it. You are willing to give up anything because you want it so bad. And you want it now. There is this advert, I believe I watch it sometimes, maybe many years ago. He said, I want my money and I want it what? Now. I mean if you have watched that before. Yeah. I want my money and I want it what? Now. See? So God wants you to have that kind of frame of mind. I want God now, not tomorrow. Food can stay. Pleasure, relax. Possession, just stay on hold. I want the righteousness of God. Blessed are those, happy are those who are really hungry for they shall be filled. Many of you heard my testimony about being filled with the power of God. It has to do with a hunger. With a hunger. The hunger was so much that even if first lady calls me, I can't be on the phone for even up to 30 seconds because I was so desperate for God. I wanted God so much that nothing else matters to me in life. Even then when I went to work, in fact, I'm, I'm there but I'm not there. My mind is, God, I want to experience this. God, I have been praying. Oh God, I just want you to show up in my life. I want your presence. I want to see, experience your glory. Fill me up, oh God. That was a hunger. And I knew what that took away from me. I knew I was hungry every day. She would tell you. I wake up in the morning, early in the morning, probably four o'clock in the morning. I am praying, God, do something. God, there was a hunger. I didn't care for food for days and weeks and months. Not caring for food. I just, all I just cared about was God. I just want you. I am hungry for you. Now, that is hunger. Because I knew what I was hungry for. The Bible says, blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty after righteousness, for they shall be what? Filled. God would never deny a hungry man or a hungry woman. Guess what? God also knows your heart. If you are hungry for real or if you are just playing games with him. How hungry are you for God? How much thirsty are you for God? How much hungry are you for God? And how much thirsty are you for God? Because when you are hungry for God, nothing else really matters. Nothing else matters. Not even pleasure. I know this might be hard for some of you. See, we are different. We have different calls upon our lives. So the greater the call, the greater the sacrifice. So you have to give up a lot of things. I understand that. Many of you may not give up some things I gave up, but I know where I need to be. If I need to be where I need to be, I have to give up more stuff. I have to give up TV too. Probably I've not watched TV for, for probably for maybe a whole maybe two, three, four weeks. Probably not. Maybe probably unless I watch our, our videos. Why? I love to watch TV, but I just feel like I have so much. So much. What I'm teaching right now, I have to study this stuff. I have to study to the point where I see me. So it's coming out because I spent some time. I cannot teach what I'm teaching right now if, if I didn't study, if I didn't really let God talk to my spirit. So it's coming out now, not because uh, it's memorized, because I studied for so long, for the whole week, so that it sinks in me, so I could just come and just be talking to you like the Bible is already inside of me. 
When I'm watching TV, guess what? I'll be telling you stories about Oprah, stories about CNN. Guess what? And many pastors do that too. So let the time keep going until they say the last prayer. So the truth is this. You have to have a hunger. And the hunger, this is, this is where it goes. The more hungry you are, the more of him you will need. And you think you got it, the hunger level increases. So the, the hunger is filled, but not really completely filled, because the moment you think it's filled, the more you are hungry for him. Reminds me of somebody. Let me start with an example in the Bible. Moses. Everyone say Moses. Say it again. Say it one more time. Everyone shout Moses. Amen. Moses. 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 Moses is a man who literally walked with God. Saw God face to face. The Bible says, wow, it's on the screen. Let me see. This my brother is something else. He's putting, what do I want to do in there? <laughs> Praise God. So Moses, the Bible says that Moses was in the Wilderness, desert, for how many years? 40 years. I must say 40 years. 40 years. Not 40 days. 40 years. This man was there having an encounter with God. And the Bible said God appeared to him in a burning bush. And God told him, take off your sandals. And God spoke to Moses. Audibly, Moses heard God. This is not like Moses just think God was talking. He heard God talk. The fire. Hearing a voice from the fire. And God said, no, stop right there. Take off your shoes. And Moses took off his shoes. And God began to deal with Moses. And the Bible says that when it was time for God to give the Ten Commandments, Moses saw God right on the Ten Commandments. Right, right. On the, on the piece of stone. So Moses have a counter with God. Moses have spent time with God. But guess what? In the book of, in, in chapter 32 of Exodus, the Bible talks about Moses. The Bible says that God instructed Moses to build a tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, God would show up as a pillar of cloud and also fire at night. But you know what Moses said? Say, God, I want more of you. Say, Moses, wait a minute, Moses. You've seen God. You have, you've seen him in the fire. You've seen him write already on, on a tablet. He asked, what more do you want? Moses said, no, 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 God, no, no. God, you're not God, I want you. If your presence don't go with me, forget it. Show me your glory. Moses said what? Show me your glory. But yet Moses had already experienced God. In the burning bush he saw God. When he goes out, the Bible even says that Moses would go talk to God. When he comes out from meeting with God, his face would shine. That people can't even behold him. That Moses have to put on a veil to cover his face because his face was shining. This man had an encounter with God, but yet he wants more of God. Everyone say more of God. Because if you're already in the kingdom, you want more of God. If you are not in the kingdom, more of God is not an issue with you. So that, you have to ask yourself, am I in the kingdom? If you are in the kingdom, how much of God do you really want in your life? Because that is a proof for you. Not for me, you know. Do you want him? How much do you want him? Are you really hungry for more of him? Moses had encounters with God, but yet he was hungry for more. Everyone say more. So that was a good example of Moses. How about David? David in the Bible, the Bible says David is a man after my own heart. The Bible says in Psalm 23 verse 1 to verse 8, he said the Lord is my shepherd. Now this is Moses having a personal experience with God. Moses knows God. He knows who God is. Even God says Moses is a man after my heart. Even God says he is the apple of my eyes. That means that if you try to touch God's eyes, you know, Moses, God's eye, Moses represents the apple of God's eyes. 
You get God's attention. Not Moses, sorry. David. So David was really having an encounter with God. David has encounters with God. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie in great pasture. Right? He leadeth me beside still waters. Right? And he even said, towards, towards the end of the verse, he said, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Even though I walk through the shadows of the valley of death, I shall fear no evil. The Lord is always with me. So this is a man who, have, who knows God firsthand. But you know what Moses said? As the deer panted after the water, so my soul longed after you. Even after everything Moses has experienced, he's still hungry for God. That is a sign that you are in his kingdom. Moses, uh, not Moses, David is hungry for God. David is still saying, God, as the deer panted after the water, so my soul panted after you. And the Bible says, in Psalm 63, let's go to Psalm 63. Let's do that. Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Let's see, David, how much hunger he is, how much hungry and thirsty he is for God. Psalm 63. 63. Let's see what he said. Now, verse 1. So 3 verse 1. O God, thou art my God. Early in the morning will I seek thee. My soul thirsted for thee. My flesh longed for thee. In the dry and thirsty land where no water is. And he kept on saying, to see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. So David said, I want to see more of you. I want more of your presence. I want more of your glory. Like I have seen in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Verse 4. First will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. This is David. This is a man who already have God, experienced God to a high level. But yet he is still hungry for God. And was a hunger. See, so the proof that you are already in his kingdom is the hunger in you for God. How hungry are you for God? Are you willing to let go of your sleep because of God? Of your pleasure because of God? Of your possession because of God? Of your pride and power of praise seeking because of God? That hunger is a proof that you, you are in his kingdom. Now that's a tough message, but that is what the Bible says. It is not only the entry point, it is also the way of life in the kingdom. So Moses was hungry for more. David was hungry for more. How about Paul? Paul was hungry for more of God too. The Bible talks about Paul. Paul is a man who have written more than half of the New Testament. He have written doctrines upon doctrines in the scripture. This man Paul has, he knows the Bible. He knows the law. The Bible says Paul went to the third heavens. Paul saw Jesus face to face. He met Jesus on his way to Damascus. So Paul really knows God. Paul has preached the message of God, the gospel of Christ to many people in his time. But yet, the Bible says of Paul in Philippians chapter 3 verse 10, that I may know him. That I may know him. Philippians 3 verse 10. And the power of his resurrection. Philippians 3 verse 10. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his suffering. Be made conformable unto death. That this is a man who still wants to say, Wait a minute Paul. I thought you knew God already. 
I thought you already been with God. You've already been to the third heaven. Wait a minute, Paul. You've gotten revelation upon revelation. Wait a minute, Paul. You wrote the Bible, Paul. Wait a minute. What's happening with you? Paul says, no. I want more of him. I want to know him more. I want to know that. I, want to, I just want to know the power I will, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Paul said, you know what? I just don't want... Paul said, you know what, God? I know you, but I really don't know you. But I, I know you, but God, I, I just want to know you more. Now, that is a sign that you are in. When you ask yourself tonight, am I in or am I just about to get in? And if you're already in, do you want to stay in? Because that is what it is. That is what it takes. It's a hunger. That is a life of the kingdom. That was the message of Jesus. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at where? Hand. Repent. So we talked here so far about Moses. We talked to you already about, about uh, uh, David and about Paul. Even more in the Bible, even with Peter and on, on and on. Really wanted to have God more in their life. Now, let's talk about you. Look at someone, tell them, let's talk about me. <laughs> I wasn't going to say, let's talk about you, because then you're you going to make you feel good. Say, let's talk about me. Say, let's talk about me. Because we've talked about Moses, we talked about David, we've talked about Paul. How about you? How much of him do you really want in your life? Happy are those who are hungry and thirsting after righteousness. I wish I had time to tell you a little bit of this word in the, in, in the Greek language. But let me just throw a little bit of it, just a little bit of education to you here. With that word, how it was used in Greek with this hunger after righteousness. In the Greek language, in the study of the Greek language, when they use the word hunger for something, they use it like this. Hunger for the food. Hunger for a food. Hunger and thirst for a water. That is the way they say it. Though it doesn't sound right in our English language, but in, in, when they're hungry for something, they don't say I'm hungry for food. To them, that means you're hungry for all the food. They don't say I'm thirsty for water. They say I'm thirsty for a water. So that way, that means that they are not thirsty for all the water in the whole world. But when it comes to this word righteousness, they remove that phrase, that word, that could make it look like you are thirsty for a part, a, a part of righteousness. It says hunger for righteousness. Everything. Everyone say everything. Everyone say everything. Now, what is righteousness? You're hungry for everything. What is righteousness? Many of you already have no hunger for righteousness. You, it's easy for you to define it. You say, right standing with God. That's good. That's it. Right standing with God. But there's more to that. This righteousness, thank God that he has, he has already imputed on us his righteousness. Amen? 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 Amen. Amen. But guess what? When Jesus made this teaching, guess what? He had not died yet. You getting that? When Jesus was teaching someone on the mount, he has not gone to the cross yet. This was before the cross. He was teaching under the law. Are you getting this? Everyone say Bible studies. Say with me. Let's say it together. Study. To show, to show yourself approved, approved. child of God that is able to rightly divide the word of truth. So that's why we study, we study so we can rightly divide the word of, the word of truth. So you can rightly divide the word of God. You study so that the word of God makes a meaning in your life. I was telling somebody today that I get so frustrated with pastors 
who will take a scripture just to get what they want and not really teach you that scripture. They know, I think they know what it's saying, but they'll twist it for their own benefit to, to, to prove a point. No, let the scripture prove your point, not your point prove the scripture. Amen? Let the scripture correct you, but don't correct the scripture with your life. Don't say because I'm a drug addict, so let me find the scripture to say this so that it's okay. Don't say because I drink all the time, let me put the scripture that says, uh, uh, after all, Paul told Timothy, drink wine for your stomach ache. So every day you have your stomach ache now. God said, drink wine, so oh, my stomach hurt. Give me some wine, please. See, that is for your, you are twisting the Bible now to, for your own, your own gain. And people do that. People do that. They just twist it. The Bible says, you know, I'm saved, so anything I do is okay. No, 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 no. Everything I do is not okay. So the Bible says, happy are those who are hungry and seeking after righteousness. Now let's break it down. What's righteousness? Righteousness composed of two things. What Jesus is talking about, even through the pages of the scripture, referring to two things. In the book of Isaiah, towards the end, book of Isaiah, chapter 16, 61, 62, 63, Isaiah defined righteousness as salvation. Everyone say salvation. Happy are those who are saved. Happy are those who seek and hunger after salvation. Happy are those who come to God for salvation. Happy are those who are saved. To be truly happy, you have to be saved. Let me tell you, the prescription for happiness is salvation. If you are not saved, you, you cannot be truly happy if you are not saved. Those of you who are not saved here tonight or watching by the means of, of the media, you cannot be truly happy if you are not saved. You have to be saved to be happy. It is salvation that is a prescription for happiness. Pleasure don't bring you happiness. Power don't bring you happiness. Possession don't bring you happiness. Sex don't bring you happiness. It is all short-lived. It is salvation that brings you happiness. And Jesus said, happy are those who thirst and hunger after salvation. Who thirst and hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So you step in God's kingdom and you get saved. Everyone say you get saved when you get in. Say it again. Say it again. Amen. Don't forget, I told you that the Sermon on the Mount is not just a prescription to getting in, it's also a way of life where, when you already were in. So the second part of righteousness that Christ was talking about has to do with sanctification. What is sanctification? Sanctification basically means becoming more like Jesus. Because there has to be a hunger to be more like him. There has to be a hunger because the more you spend time in the presence of Jesus, the more you smell and talk and look like Jesus. I don't know if you believe that. Let me hear you say amen. The more you spend time with somebody, the more you really be like them. Believe me. That's why you better watch who you spend time with. Because after a while, you start talking like them, acting like them, and living like them. If they have a very short fuse, before you know it, your fuse starts getting shorter. Believe me. It's just a matter of time. If they are always full of anger, before you know it, the anger rubs off. If they are loving and caring, before you know, you start becoming loving and caring. It just rubs off. So the more you are in the person's presence, the more you become like that person. So the more you are in the presence of God, the more you are becoming who God wants you to be. So blessed are those who are hungry and thirsting after salvation and sanctification. What is sanctification? Becoming like Christ. Holy living. Everyone say holy living. Holy living. But pastor, man, this word, I heard it 20 years ago. I know, but it's still in the Bible. The Bible says, be ye holy as I am what? Say with me, that scripture is in the New Testament. 
Say it again. Sadly. And holiness means sanctification. Set apart. Not living the life of the world. It's difficult for you to bring your friends to Christ when you are living just like them. They won't listen to you. You can fake it, but after a while they will know the, the real you. That you're not really real. You can't be doing stuff with your friends and expect them to go to the house of God with you. They may go first two, three times out of invitation, but after a while they will stop coming because you are not, you are living a lie. And God does not want us to live a lie. He wants us to live the truth. So the Bible said, Jesus is teaching us tonight from, his, from, the, from the Sermon on the Mount that blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty after salvation and sanctification for they shall be what? Filled. If you are hungry, you eat the bread. He said, I'm the living, I'm, I'm also at, at the spring of living water. If you want to drink any water, it's Jesus. If you want to eat bread, that's Jesus. Anywhere you go, if you're hungry for food, Jesus is food. If you are thirsty to drink, Jesus is drink. He said, I am. So he said, but he told the woman at the well, if you drink of me, you shall not thirst no more. When you drink of the water that God, Jesus, gives to you, you will not test no more. For what? For the things of the word. Because the woman was going to get water, to drink. He said, it's true, God, many of us don't understand scripture. If you drink of me, you will not test no more of the things of the word, of the water you're looking for. Because everything you need is in Christ. Everything you need is in Christ. So blessed are those who are thirsty and hungry after salvation and sanctification. For they shall be filled. So tonight, I'll pose you one or two questions. Are you hungry? And if you're hungry, what are you hungry for? Are you hungry for more food? You hungry for more pleasure? You you just want to have pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Are you hungry for more amusement? Somebody that amuse you? Or are you hungry for power? What are you hungry for? Are you hungry for the presence of God? Are you hungry to be more like Jesus? I challenge you, and I'm glad. I thank God. I truly thank God. For blessing me. I do. You know why? Because when God blesses you, like many of you here are blessed in natural sense and spiritual sense. You are not hungry for God because you don't have the things that the world provides. You have everything. And when I was a young boy, something really captivated my attention. I got a video that was played I believe by the Gator Brothers. I don't know if I don't know if they're still here. Gator Brothers, the Gator Brothers, you know of the group. They are almost back then. It's old people singing, old, really old men, real old. I and mean, now they have some young group now, but old people singing that song. I say, God. Then I was in Africa. I say, man, they got these men just worshiping you and just serving you, God. I want to just serve you, God. I want to just just look at them. They have everything. They're serving you. They're not serving you because they need food. Not because they need money. Not because they need a car. They got a car. They got a house. They got everything. God, just bless me, God. I'm going to just serve you. You know, as a young boy, I was so fascinated. Because growing up, I think people that serve God are those who are needy. I thought they are serving God because they are struggling. Because they are broke. Because they are poor. Or because whatever. That was the impression. They even met phrases like this. He is as poor as a church rat in where I, where I come from. That means that the rat that stays in the church, they are skinny. I mean, church is broke. When I saw this man worshiping and serving God, I said, God, wow. So people can still be prosperous and still serve you. And that was a challenge to me. 
I want to challenge you tonight that wherever you are in the spectrum of this world, there is no excuse why you should not serve God. Whether you have a lot of money or whether you are broke, you can still serve God. Whether you are struggling to meet your needs or you have excess of resources of this world, you can still serve God. Nothing should stop you from serving God. Nothing. Nothing should stop you from seeking more after God. When you seek more after him, the Bible says, ye shall be filled. That is the promise of God. And because God has promised us that, he will fill us up. Amen? Let us rise as we pray. Were you blessed tonight? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. We bless you. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you, Lord, because we are really hungry for you. We want more of you. More. You said in your word, except our righteousness surpasses those of the scribes and the Pharisees who will not even enter the kingdom of God. Lord, your word said so. Help also God to have the hunger for the things of God. To have a hunger, Lord, for you. To be more like you. Sanctification. Be more like Jesus. Help also God. I pray, Father, for this body that is here tonight. This God's children in this house. Lord, my God, I pray that Lord, that you will, O oh God, you will, O oh God, put a deep hunger in their spirit, in their soul, after the things of God. That they will be hungry, Lord, for righteousness. They will be hungry, Lord, to be in right standing with you. They will be hungry, God, to experience you to the degree they have never experienced before. Lord, we bless you and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give a clap to the Lord.